please welcome Mark Bowell. Thank you. Well, just to begin the evening with an unvarnished plug, I want to point out that the, the shooting draft of The Hurt Locker has been published by New Market Press, and you probably get it at Borders or order it online. And I, I highly recommend it specifically because of the purposes of what we're doing here. It, uh, you know, there are many excellent scripts. This one repays study, I thought, particularly, because it's very leanly written, and uh, it seems to fulfill several things that a good script needs, the, three, the big three, which are first-hand experience, imagination, and craft. Those are, the, those are the three qualities that this script has in abundance. So I thought, just to get rolling, I, I, I thought that experience, because one thing, you know, there are many films that imagine the war in Iraq, or, you know, we get a lot of it on TV. You went boots on the ground there. And I thought a, a good place to start is if you could just tell us about what was in your mind as you, as you sought this. How did you pursue going to Iraq, and what did you expect to find as opposed to what you found? Uh, yeah, I went there in um, at the end of 2004 uh, on an assignment um, uh, as a reporter for Playboy magazine, uh, and uh, it's the probably the only time in my life that it, that I've been uh, more proud to be writing for Playboy than than say writing for the New York Times because when you're standing in front of a platoon of 19-year-olds with, <laughs> with the Baghdad bureau chief of the New York Times and he says he's from the Times and you say you're from Playboy, <laughs> you go first and he goes. <laughs> so that was, um, but um, it was, it was you know, it was my first, uh, I had been covering the military uh, domestically. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, but uh, I really felt like if I wanted to understand the war, I had to go see it. Yeah. And uh, had you already had written you. had you already written the articles that became uh, the film in the Valley of Elah? Was that, had that already been done, or or was that still in your future? Uh, yeah. No, that had, I had done that already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I had done that and a couple of other. Um, you know, pieces that took me to bases and so forth, but um, I really wanted to see it firsthand and um, came up with the idea of focusing on the bomb squad uh, because at that time, and it's, I mean, it remains true today, but at that time it was especially the case that IEDs, the roadside bombs, were the central tactic of the insurgency and they were really, to me, on a kind of military level, uh, and on a strategic level, defining what the war was all about. So, mm. in terms of getting a topical angle into the war, y you know, doing a profile of the men who were fighting at that level seemed like the most logical choice, and it actually hadn't been done yet. Um, so it was kind of a scoop as well. So um, that was the idea, and then as soon as I got there, and I actually started going out on missions with these guys, you basically, y y the, the, the army, has this program, which they call an embed program, which is, I guess, different for everybody. But for me, it was pretty much they just uh, threw me in a trailer and said, good luck, and like, you know, whatever you can. I, I know if you bring a TV camera, they're a little more um, restrictive about what you can and can't do. But but being a reporter for Playboy, I don't think they were <laughs> they were too worried. <laughs> and um, so, uh, so, but as soon as I started going out with them and realizing just in incredibly how, how dangerous and, and, and incredibly lethal the environment and unpredictable it was, um, I wanted to go home, but, but uh, <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's not like Delta where you can just call up and book a flight out. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> so anyway, so I toughed it out. I was there for three weeks and, um, uh, you know, came back and, and, and did this piece uh, for Playboy. But actually, before I did the piece, I, I was already thinking about it as a as a movie, uh, partly because I had uh, begun to talk to Paul Haggis about uh, what became in the Valley Vela, and I was really starting to try to think of, of ways to, to, another way to break into screenwriting. And um, so I actually ended up writing the first draft of the screenplay before the article. Um, and uh, and then there were many drafts after that, but that's how it all started. And you you were with you were three weeks with one particular unit, or did you move from one unit to the next and get a sampling of characters? Uh, well, no, with one unit in Baghdad, um, uh, you know, but probably fifty people in that unit. Oh, and. Uh, 
you know, because the the characters are, are particularly well drawn. Uh, the, the 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 three main guys, the um, particularly William James, who's the adrenaline. I don't know. It struck me two ways. One is that, you know, you, you clearly you must have observed these guys firsthand, and maybe there's a, an actual basis for each of them. But I also felt. You know, on on reading the script, especially, I thought, no, there's a, an imaginative thing going on here too, because it would seem to me that that William James, the guy who's the the one who's scariest to the other two, is the one that's seeking something like adrenaline rush, like like a you know, like perhaps you were, and then again there's Sanford, who's really skeptical, and Eldridge, who's really f right. fearful and fatalistic by by turns. I'm thinking, were you? They they could be seen as uh, warring halves of one psych. Were you just like drawing on several aspects of your Self in addition, to, and could you talk about just how you brewed those guys? Um, yeah, that's a good question. You know, and and I think it's um, it's kind of all of the above and 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 more. Um, uh, yeah, certainly it started with with observing these guys and what they were doing, but um, it 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 very quickly became a work of fiction, and um, I you know I I took bits and pieces from here and there and bits and pieces from myself and bits from stories I heard from other people and, and uh, some of whom were EOD techs, that's the name of the bomb squad, and some of whom were just soldiers that had been um, in Iraq. Some of them were contractors that had been in Iraq. I mean, I ended up doing a lot of kind of reporting on the screenplay in addition to reporting for the article. So mm. I probably, you know, conservatively talked to 100 soldiers. Um, Outside of the bomb squad, mm. uh, and you know, if I met any time, I would meet somebody uh, in the course of of you know being a journalist. That if I met somebody on a plane, you know, then they had been to Iraq, I'd try to say, "Hey, what's the craziest thing that ever happened to you?" Or what mm. you know, what what do you remember most about it? So it was really just a kind of um, a mishmash of a lot of different influences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it is a, 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 it's a very strong digression in the film. In fact, when when it it, it when revisiting the film, it, it it came back like a memory. It's when they they're off and they're trapped with the mercenaries and they're under fire. It's like completely out of their usual agenda of defusing bombs. But it's so much the war in Iraq at the same time, and it's it's it's, it's a great occasion to get to go th know those guys outside that context. How did that scene develop? Well, that one was. Um Oh, there were like a couple of different, different factors involved in that. One was that there was a guy I knew um, who I was actually pretty good friends with at the time um, who had told me that uh, he, had, he he was telling me about a gunfight that he had been in. Not not in the bomb squad. He was actually a, um, uh, a contractor, a mercenary. And one of the things that he remembered most about it is that when it got really bad, they were... Um, having to reuse the bullets of some of the guys that had been shot and the bullets got bloody mm. that from being close to the body and so he was just telling me about r rubbing the blood off the bullets and that that detail kind of never left me mm -hmm. um, after he told me about it and so I was kind of always looking <laughs> looking for a place to use it and part of the you know that that kind of became the seed that that, that germinated and became that scene um, even though in the end it didn't become such a such a key part of the scene in a way it is a, a big character moment for the for James and Eldridge because uh, Eldridge has to end up cleaning these bullets and and he can't quite can't quite do it and James comes down and helps him and shows a more nurturing side of himself than than maybe we've been aware of so um, there was that and the other thing is somebody had told me um, that uh, the scariest thing that had ever happened to him in Iraq was getting a flat tire. Um, because he had been driving around and uh, didn't have a wrench, did, couldn't fix it, and so he stuck on the side of the road. And mm. the longer you're in any one place, the <clears throat> the greater the likelihood of, of getting into a fight. And uh, so the combination of those two stories, plus the need and the desire to, you know, there's only so many times you can you can have your characters disarm a bomb and, and ask the audience not to sure. get bored. And so, you know, the desire to mix things up a little bit, um, and also give give Ray Fiennes uh, something to do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, originally, uh, there was a, a scene that uh, where Rafe was going to play a um, uh, a diplomat, and uh, he didn't want to play a diplomat. And I really, you know, we all really wanted Rafe in the movie, and so all that stuff together. And I said, "What about a mercenary?" And he was like, "That that would be good." So. Um, <laughs> it was the combination of those three influences. This touches on a question because there you are, um, basically, 
having produced this script, you were also brought aboard as a as a producer, and perhaps we can talk m in more detail about that as we go. But it, it's it strikes me as an interesting role that you're playing. That you were actually in consultation with the actors uh, while the script was being developed. Was that you had already done a first draft, and then you were working with the director Bigelow to get the uh, to get a new draft and and deciding how to cast for the, it for the Rafe thing. Well, I think yeah. we had a draft. It was done, and we showed it to Rafe. And and uh, I mean, I might be speaking out of school here a little bit, but. Um, but in any case, the, the, you know, we worked with him to, to make him to, to, so he could find his way into the film. But um, I did produce it uh, largely because um, uh, Catherine asked me to, and I, I didn't. I'd never produced a film before, and um, uh, it, it didn't seem like there were that, there were that many other people that were dying to produce a, another Iraq War movie. Uh, <laughs> Um, it was kind of like going to somebody and saying, like, I have a briefcase full of plutonium. Would you like to carry it for me? <laughs> <laughs> so nobody really wanted. So, it w but it turned out to be a great, a great experience, uh, creatively, uh, if not financially. And um, uh, you know, I learned uh, a ton, I think, about the movie. You know, how a movie is put together, and and it kept me involved, you know, as a writer in a way that I think is is sometimes unusual for writers. And um, you know, I didn't. I didn't get any notes on the on the movie. Not because I was a producer, just because the way we finance it. But I mean, on the script. Um, but really, being able to, you know, see the film go through all its stages from from the initial drafts to you know um, publicity plans mm -hmm. uh, two years later. It's it's been pretty extraordinary. What now? I'd like to talk a little more about that. Perhaps you. I, I think you knew if if I, the, from the introduction, you and Catherine Bigelow knew each other before you even went to Iraq. And so, had you talked to her about the possibility of a film before you went? Uh, not before I went. We had uh, tried to do a TV show uh, a couple of years before that that uh, became a show called The Inside, but was originally something else. And. Um, so I knew her, and I wasn't really. But but when then when I came back, and I had the idea to to maybe turn this into a movie, and I was kind of feeling um, a, a bit emboldened by by Paul's interest in the other thing. Um, she was a natural person to go to because uh, you know she's a obviously a in, incredibly gifted director, and 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 the only other person in town that I knew. So it was <laughs> <laughs> it was a natural. Yeah. Choice. Now. Um, she is it true that it was shot on sixteen super sixteen and 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 those things to keep the budget down? Well, I think yeah. I mean, part of that is a was a budget thing. It ended up actually not being any cheaper than film because we shot so much footage. We shot a million. Catherine shot a million feet of footage, but um, I think her her main reason was well two twofold. The way she's explained it to me is um, part of it is the aesthetics of super sixteen. She just loved the 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 um, the density of the film and and the Fuji stock actually that uh, that they have now. Is, is not like the Super 16 that most people think of when they think of Super 16. It's actually incredibly advanced and picks up a lot of nuance. But the other thing is the cameras are very small uh, compared to a, mm. a regular 35 millimeter camera. And the way we were shooting fast um, and with a lot of uh, units, it allowed Catherine to, and, and Barry Aykroyd, who I think, by the way, did an amazing job and his whole team, um, to, to run and gun and pick up a lot of footage quickly and put cameras in places that there that it would, you could do with a 35 millimeter camera but would take a lot more time like okay let's put the camera under the Humvee so you just throw a guy under a Humvee with a camera but if it's a you know that you can do that if they're small and uh, it's they're easier to change uh, the magazine changes are faster so it just allows you to get more quicker but yeah. the film itself is actually not that much cheaper I ask not not to not to belabor it but the production but simply because uh, we have so many writers in the room, it's a, it's a very interesting object lesson how you protected, I mean, your script was in a kind of protected space because you had bonded early with the director and were were brought aboard. And um, Yeah, I mean, I think that there are a couple of reasons for that. The, the, probably the biggest one is that I wrote it on spec. And so, you know, you get a lot, uh, you get some power when you're working for free um, that you don't have, I think, when you're taking money. But... Um, but Kat, but 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 you're right. The main thing is that Catherine and I really kind of had a shared vision for how the movie would look, and we were, and and how it would feel, and um, you know we wanted to to kind of have it be its own thing, and we were very lucky in that the uh, gentleman who financed it, uh, a guy named Nicolas Chartier. Um, uh, who happens to be French had what I think of as a very French attitude about the uh, creative process and didn't actually ever 
try to interfere mostly and um, <laughs> well the one thing he wanted from the beginning was helicopters and this is um, which I, which I understood because he you know he just said look could you please figure out a way to put some helicopters in it? And um, <laughs> well, better helicopter than a mistress, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. Well, that was the other. His other problem was, you know, one big part for an actress would be great. I, that's not going to happen, Nick. There's no, you know, there there are women in the bomb squad, but that's just not this movie. But I said we could do. I can help you with the helicopter thing. Um, you know, Black Hawk Down, et cetera. It would be a good commercial move. But uh, so I wrote in some stuff with helicopters. And then I worked really hard in Jordan to actually get the helicopters, which was a pain in the ass because, uh, you know, it turns out a military helicopter is not the easiest thing to obtain. But it's possible. And I worked with the Jordanian military and getting them on set and paying for them, like, by the half an hour and, 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 and all this. And uh, two helicopter scenes, or two scenes that have helicopters in them, both of which were cut, like, so <laughs> early <laughs> on in the editor's draft. So that was Nick's note that, uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to, to satisfy. But otherwise, he was very hands-off, and, uh, you know, we he loved the script from the beginning. Uh, and he um, he had just come off of financing. Uh, he was part of the pi financing uh, package for Crash. And so he was, I think, you know, feeling bullish and everything. And... Um, and he just said, you know, go for it. And, and we did. There's something, you know, in terms of the structure of the film, something I was admiring when reading it was how many, um, in effect, switcheroos you pull. I mean, if you, that, that each scene um, completely capsizes our expectation by the end of it, it seemed to me, in one way or another. For example, the, the very first scene, the team leader, even though I didn't necessarily recognize Guy Pierce the first time I saw it, you felt, okay, this is, this is like our protagonist. And he blows up at the end of the scene. Oh, my God, you know, you're, you're knocked out of your chair. And then in the next one, we've got, you know, the switcheroo is that this nice guy that comes in as the new boss is, you know, potentially a Captain Ahab and very crazy. And that's, that's another switch. And it just keeps going and, and, and and the ultimate one is Beckham, uh, as he's called, the DVD boy who, I mean, the possibility of his death motivates the most enormous action of the, of the film. So I'm just wondering, I mean, it, it was, I liked that constant uh, sliding, that sort of taking its mask off as it keeps going. And I wondered, at what point in your development of it did that start to happen? Was that just a, a characteristic of what was pouring out of you, or was it something that you, you discovered as you were trying to make these elements mix? That's a good, that's a really interesting question. I don't really know, the, I'm not sure I can remember the answer in terms of the chronology of the writing, but I think, um, it was certainly important for me to to make it as tense as possible, mm -hmm. and um, and part of that is withholding information, and not um, you know letting people know where you're going, um, and trying to put the audience in the position of being you know not outside the scene observing it, um, but kind of like as if you were there observing it, and you didn't have any extra information beyond the information that any of one of the participants has. Um, so uh, that was like a very subjective way of, you know, like placement of the audience and, and maybe a little unusual. But um, uh, I, the, 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 the flips that you're talking about, I think, also came out of the desire to really make it a character piece. Mm -hmm. I mean, in addition to the helicopters, um, <laughs> uh, you know, and the bombs and stuff to... Uh, try to present a profile, use this character of James as a, as a, as a profile of somebody who doesn't really change throughout the movie. I mean, in the sense that he doesn't have like a, a sort of more traditional epiphanal moment and then you watch him transform into a new human being. He's sort of the same guy from the beginning of the movie mm. to the end. But there is a change that occurs in it. it, it I, the idea was it occurs in the audience and your opinion of him changes mm. so, that there's the, so that the arc is is out there instead of on screen. And in order to do that, you just kind of have to cheat a little bit and not tell people everything right off the bat. And um, so that you're constantly seeing different sides of the same of the yeah. same person. It, it helps very strongly that you've got a, a as it were, a point of view character in Sanborn, you know, who, who is there from the beginning. Mm. Uh, he, he departs the picture. Finally, it's taken over by, by James. But, but, uh, but he's almost like Sanborn is the skeptical character who has to deal with this crazy new boss. And in a way, he's like the detective trying to solve the mystery of this guy. Yeah, you know? yeah. 
Did, how much did it alter, you know, uh, how much did it change when you, when you got, had your director on board and you started going to action? Did you, did you do, how, what kind of rewrites were you doing in the field, if any? Um, a lot of rewrites, well, not a lot, but a, a rewrites mostly having to do with the staging of the action to fit the location. Um, so the scenes themselves didn't really change uh, it, that I can think of, but but the way they laid out the blocking of them changed. If you know, because I was just making this stuff up in 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 L.A. and then when we got to Jordan and you'd see quite how the streets were laid out, it it was a great pleasure to rewrite it to actually fit that scene specifically, like the one in the uh, bombs. Uh, with the car bomb mm. uh, at that UN building was originally written to take place on street level, and we, uh, I mean, we went all over the place in Morocco looking for the place that I had written about mm. with these different walls. It was like this street with walls and a back alley, and then we went all over Jordan looking for a place like I had written. And then finally, I think one day I just said, this is insane. Why don't we just find a cool place, and then I'll write it to fit the place. Why are we running around... I mean, maybe that place I wrote doesn't even exist. It probably doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. found this place that has a school, and then this it was a school that we turned into the UN building, and then it had, I realized it had a beautiful rooftop, which gave you this kind of vista onto the rest of the city. Uh, and I was standing up there one day with uh, one of the... Uh, stunt guys we were talking about you know various ways you could blow up a car or something and I realized hey put one of the soldiers up on the roof and you'll get uh, rewrite the scene so one guy's on the roof and one guy's on the ground and instead of it being on street level it takes place uh, mm. you know in more three-dimensionally uh, and uh, so anyway th there was stuff like that mm-hmm mm -hmm. if you could talk about um, coming upon screenwriting you were you had been a journalist for about 15 years before before getting into like before the Valley of Eli got bought I guess we were talking backstage I, just if you could talk about your original ambitions was filmmaking actually had, had it long been a goal for you had it been a goal from the beginning that you know uh, well I think originally I wanted to be a um, you know like I wanted to write the great American novel or something like that and um, and then I became a reporter and a journalist and uh, um, I, I got uh, I mean, I've always loved movies, and but it never really occurred to me that I that I could be a, a screenwriter. It always seemed, you know, when you're sitting in New York City as a reporter, it, Hollywood just seems completely impermeable and, and bizarre. Um, and so it, it, you would hear stories of people that had sold an article to right. to to Hollywood, and anybody that sold an article, you automatically hated because that meant that they were now rich, <laughs> and they would have to throw a party just to like you know avoid getting getting bumped on the street. And uh, and then I sold an article. I, w I became one of those guys um, before uh, the Paul thing, and. Um, uh, and I got kind of a little bit exposed to it, and then I sold another one uh, that be that was that TV show that I mentioned. And um, the more I, I sort of started to 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 uh, dip my toe in, the more I felt like, well, this could be a, a, perhaps another career. And um, so at a certain point, I I really put the journalism on hold and tried to to uh, become a full time screenwriter. And uh, you know, there were some some pretty tough years before Hurt Locker was made, then after Hurt Locker was made, a year mm. before it came out, and when it was kind of sitting on ice for a little while. Um, but, uh, you know, five years later, it seems to have paid off. Because it strikes me that, you know, if, if we look at movie history, the history of screenwriters, especially from Ben Heck to Cameron Crowe, a, there's a very strong tradition of journalists. And were you, how conscious were you of that? Oh, I was pretty conscious of it. I mean, I did, I would do these Google searches, like journalists, screenwriters, to see if, if any, you know, <laughs> and I had a list of these people at one point to see if anybody had, had you know, how common it was, uh, you know, Cameron Crowe. A lot of people that I actually uh, ad admired, but not really knowing their power. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, um, anyway, there's Nora Ephron. There's a lot of sure. examples. Joe but, Esther um, Hass is all, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Nora, actually, I went to a, um, I saw her say one time that the reason she started screenwriting is she couldn't uh, get a job at The New Yorker. And, um, I think that's that's probably true for me too. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think what's important too for writers who are not journalists is there is something about 
I, I hate to call it researching it, but that there's no better word, sort of doing the legwork on a script and getting to know the reality that you're writing about. And uh, could you talk a little about that, about just somehow getting past your imagination, the craft of, of, of getting out there and, and, and finding the story in life? Well, that's been uh, very important to me. I mean, like I, I said, I tried to write fiction when I was younger, and uh, I didn't really, I mean, I just started writing stories about my girlfriend, which were totally boring, and um, that uh, that was what led me to reporting because I really I wanted to go out and you know more or less see the world, and I guess it kind of stuck and became a habit to to the point where now if I want to write something, it's it's important for me to go out and at least have some, you know, pretty. Um, you know, more than initial, but like fairly deep contact with whatever it is that I'm writing about. It doesn't mean that the story is going to be true necessarily, or, or there, there's a one-to-one -one relationship, but it just kind of gets me past that feeling of, an, of you're out of your mind if you think you can do this, because at least I have some, some grounding in it. Mm -hmm. It seems, too, that it informed you even as a producer, because it, you, you came upon the spontaneous thing of, well, let's just find a really good building, and I'll write it to, to suit it. It's almost like yeah, exactly. finding the story, so to speak. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, I mean, truth is stranger than fiction. I think there's something to that, but it's also just, uh, they always say, write what you know, but I didn't happen to know very much, so, uh, you know, I, I tried to go out and, 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 and learn some things. Can you say what it was about war that you needed to know like even beginning with Valley of Eli and then moving on to Hurt Locker what was the what was the thing you were seeking for yourself can you articulate that well i mean uh you know, I wasn't I wasn't really a war correspondent, but but 9/11. Uh, I, I grew up in New York. And I grew up in the Village, and uh, that was like a really horrible day that sort of changed my life in a lot of ways. And um, I had friends that 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 died that day in, in, in the towers and, and in the fire department and so forth. And, uh, you know, seeing the city transformed into this kind of war zone. And, and then the way the nation kind of plunged into into this militaristic kind of the insanity and, and the two wars that followed and all that. So I really became, the, the military sort of was the big story I felt of my, you know, my formative years as a, as a, as a writer, as a reporter, as a man. And so I, I, I went, I wanted to understand what was going on on a human level, and that that that's kind of what drew me to it. And and then I think for the Hurlocker it was to try to f maybe poke around at what the sort of the psychological dynamics are, 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 of a warrior are, and what the sort of psychological causes of war are. Because I mean, I, I I've decently informed about the political and socioeconomic and resources and all that, all those reasons for war. But I, but for Hurlocker, I was more thinking about what what drives men to fight? Why do they pick up a gun in the first place? I mean, yeah. in addition to the quest for, for you know, three dollar uh, gallon of gas. And when you were in Iraq, it, you know, you said you decided early on to go, to go after these guys that were, you know, disarming the roadside bombs. I'm wondering, how did that emerge? You know, you must have been taking stock of the whole scene. What, when did you first notice those guys? What was the, what, what else were you dealing with at the time that you were? The roadside bomb guys? Yeah. No, well, I, th that's who I went to. Th th that was the idea from the beginning. For the article itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they had never just, they had just never been written about. They were, they were, uh, they had never, mostly be, because they were, they had never played such a critical role in any war. I mean, in the Vietnam War, they were present, uh, but mostly they were in uh, operating rooms taking shells, ordnance out of people in the middle of a surgery. The surgeon mm -hmm. would step back and say, hey, there's a grenade in the guy's leg. Like, you, you come and do that part, and then mm -hmm. the UD guy. And then they did they did some stuff in, uh, in addition to that. But, but part, they were not a... They did not have the tactical importance that they have today until until this war and 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 the kind of bombs have become really the uh, you know, the defining element of 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 twenty first century terrorism and counterinsurgency and that 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 was a new thing. So, you know, if you were doing if I was doing a movie about World War Two, probably would have tried to maybe focus on a paratrooper or a fighter pilot or somebody that was right. you know at the cutting edge on that one. But these guys were to me the the aces or what have you of of this war. It strikes me too that it, it it probably very few report no reporters went out with them before because it was also so damn dangerous and I'm wondering did you run into any bureaucratic hassle because of that? Uh, 
I don't know if they were worried about the danger. I just, uh, no, I mean, they did ask me what my, what, as soon as I landed in Baghdad, they said, what's your blood type? What's your religion? And I was like, oh, that's pretty personal, man. And, <laughs> and they go, well, just if we're going to have a funeral, we want to, you know, we want to get it right. I was literally like five minutes in country, and I was like, okay. <laughs> so uh, I, I think, um, uh, no, the bureaucratic hassle was just um, um, probably just standard red tape. I mean, mm. uh, and when you came back, you know, you had the the story to do for Playboy, and the screenplay was brewing. When, how much did you know about where it was going? When did you? What did you feel was going to be your target in there? When you knew that once you got to that truth or something or that moment that the story would be told, was there a was there a goal in your head when you were? Amassing this material into a script. Well, yeah, the idea was um, I wanted to to replicate the the insanely lethal and terrifying situation that I had experienced, and not replicate it like moment for moment, but that feeling of of that that uh, the, of extreme tension of not knowing what was going to happen next. And I mean, when I was in Baghdad, I was scared all the time because. There's no front. There's no rear. There's no moment when you can go back to Saigon and have a drink and say, "I'm not in the war right now." Because even in the base, the uh, insurgency would be lobbing missiles into the base or mortar rounds or eight-foot-long Chinese rockets. And the where I was staying in one trailer, a aluminum trailer, and two trailers down from me, it was destroyed. A mortar hit the thing and blew up. Nobody was hurt. Everybody was out during the day. But hey, if it happens, it, it happens. And it was the kind of this like complete inability to unpredict your own death, combined with the the it's totally obvious Sisyphean nature of the conflict that it was just not these guys w with the bombs were not going to go away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. That I wanted to that that created quite a sensation of terror in me at the time, and I wanted to you know <laughs> share that with the world. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was the idea. And then it just took you know uh, some some. Uh, number of false leads and so forth to get there. Yeah, I want to. There's two moments that are, uh, that are so moving in the film, and I just uh, wanted to ask about their development because they seem to be kind of operating together. One is, you know, the boy Beckham, the DVD boy that you know that uh, James William James goes out to avenge. Or, you know, he thinks he's avenging, and it becomes a whole episode. And then <laughs> the boy turns up of all things, and it's like his reaction is he can't even. It, it's beautifully expressed in the script too, by the way. It's just that you know his whole jihad was pointless. He, you you write and it, it he can't explain to the kid what what just happened or why and he just he turns away rather than deal with it and then later it's almost as if that moment is amplified when he's home in Knoxville mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering at what stage in the writing did the, the, did those moments surprise you when they came or or how did, or was there a thing that you were knew you were trying to say and, and that, that, that that those things satisfied can you uh. Oh man, I mean, there's so many calculations that go into sure. that go into stuff like that. Um, yeah. Um, I, I I'm not sure if the uh, if the the kind of symmetry that you're talking about. Um, well, in a way, it wasn't. It, it's not that the symmetry was intentional, but but I always had the idea that James was more self-aware than you thought, mm. and that he just wasn't going to tell you. Because why the fuck should he tell you? Mm. But that he was going to reveal it to his son, and then in the end, you, the audience, would get that he's actually been thinking about this on some level. And so it was just a question of, of and the, I kind of toyed with the idea. I think I might have written a scene at one point where he has this the sort of self-revelatory moment with uh, Sanborn, mm -hmm. but it felt better n if he didn't give it to Sanborn. So. Um, right. Um, and then the whole episode with the kid was really just an attempt to try to find um, a a fun way to 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 see this character. Um, fun is probably not the right word, but um, to see this character who's so competent in his core, like when he's in his lane, um, his 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 like utter inability to get any traction when he's trying to do something else, right. and he he's reached this moment where he's trying to you know almost be proactive in the war. <laughs> and so maybe a little bit of maybe take uh, charge of the war yeah yeah way. and so maybe that was my bit of uh, commentary or what have you of, of of the the uh how that might work out in real life did you encounter any uh were you able to 
have have conversations with uh, Iraqi civilians while you were there as well? Were they because seen in the kitchen with Kalim? I think not, his name not is. Not really. Yeah. I mean, there were a couple guys that uh, uh, I talked to on the base. Uh, because I needed to buy a cell phone, and they were the guys that you uh -huh. went to that sold cell phones. Um, and there were uh, a couple kids that I talked to, which is where I got the whole kid thing from, uh, selling like pornos, uh, just a gigantic back catalog of pornography. Um, but that was it. It was really, it was kind of sad, actually. I didn't have the, the kind of contact that I had hoped for. And some uh, some reporters did, actually. Uh, I mean, people like Peter Arnett went just right out, walked out into the street and sat in cafes and, and talked to people. I, uh, you know, there were some people that did that with three Blackwater mercenaries with them. And I didn't, I knew I didn't want to report that way with the guy standing behind me mm -hmm. uh, with the gun that didn't seem worthwhile. And I w didn't have the, uh, the courage to just walk out there and just start asking people questions. So unfortunately, you know, my point of view was limited to really to the experience of the, uh, of the troops mm -hmm. or those few troops that I knew. I want to open it up to questions from the floor. Your question first, sir. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll repeat the question just to not Yours. How did you how many oh. We oh, we have. I'm sorry. We do have a microphone. I, I apologize. How did you figure how many characters you're going to have in your movie? Two, three, five. The main actors. Well, we took our above the line actor salary. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was always three because I mean three main characters because that's the composition of an EOD of the bomb squad teams. They tend to be three. Uh, sometimes they're four, but uh, so that was the and then you know then you've got a triangle. So it's it, it uh, cinematically it was it seemed better than than two and and way easier than five, and true. So it had the virtue of being true. One one technical observation about the script is, is, that comes to mind is, you know, it it is so lean because if you were to remove the dialogue, it's almost like a a step outline for a movie. It it, it works it it worked perfectly as a silent movie. And I was wondering, is that was there a discipline at any point early in the the writing where you left the dialogue out because you knew you could do that or and and sort of put that in? I mean, was that any part of your preparation? Um. Well, I, you know, I think of screenwriting as 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 visual writing, uh, you know, primarily anyway, um, and you know, that really came out of the, you know, these guys are not, for the most part, you know, like characters in a Woody Allen movie. You know, they're soldiers, and so uh, it tends to be, you know, clipped sort of like uh, conversations, um, and. Um, so, you know, I want it to be naturalistic and kind of evoke that as much as possible and um, and really try to reveal character as much as possible through their actions. And, and um, you know, I, th I, I find that to be, you know, that, that excites me almost as much as, as, the, as the, you know, quippy line of, of dialogue. Mm. The question way back to the gentleman in the black shirt. Uh, you mentioned standing before a bunch of 19-year-olds, and um, I know the the actors, the leads, were probably in their 30s. Do you would you say that that was? Uh, I mean, what were the age of the guys that you actually worked with? And like, can you comment on the ages of actors that are usually cast in war movies versus the ages of the the actual soldiers that they're portraying? Um. Yeah, I, the, most most of the military guys are young. As it happens, that the EOD guys tended to be a little older, and the ones I was with were in their late twenties and early thirties. Um, so, uh, uh, um, and I and I actually did, um, you know, wanted to write people in that age range because it, it allowed me to do have them have like somewhat more interesting interior lives, I think, than maybe a nineteen year old might have. So. Um, but yeah, most of the troops are, are young guys. It's particularly the, uh, you know, the army reserves and stuff like that. So, so it wasn't really like the actors were playing somebody that they should. You know, it was it was pretty one to one actually. Were some of these guys from Desert Storm as well? Were they had they been through other conflicts than the than this one? Yeah, some of them had been. Yeah, yeah, Bosnia most recently, but yeah. Your question there. Oh, I'm sorry. No, but it's good to have it recorded. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the title? I have seen the film, but I'm still very unclear about the title. 
That might have been the only other note from from Nick was about the title. Um, the Hurt Locker. It's uh, if this bomb goes off, we're going to be uh, in the Hurt Locker. It was a military. It's a slang. Uh, it's a sports term too. It's just a bad place, a painful place. It's like uh, saying a world of hurt or yeah, you know, up, up Shit's Creek or yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should have gone back and said, okay, we'll call it Up Shit's Creek. Is that better? <laughs> no, it's it was. I'm not very good with titles. Uh, I mean, I think it's marginally better than in the Valley of Vila, which was Paul's idea, but um, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, I I actually always thought it was cool, and then I realized no one would ever know what it meant. And I always hoped that somewhere along the way in the marketing campaign, we'd have some really clever way of telling people what it meant. And it just became one of those things where we just, uh, you know, we never explained it. And and I could never find a way in the film to have somebody say, "The Hurt Locker." Oh yeah, by the way, as you know, <laughs> that means <laughs> Tom. <laughs> I thought the central character was had a really interesting mythical feeling to him, but I wondered in your research and in your visits in Iraq, did you find that there was a real person that people talked about who had that kind of reputation for being absolutely crazy and brave? No, I mean, I think the mythic part of it, you, you hit on something that was really important to me there. I thought a lot about the kind of classic uh, Greek hero that, that uh, you know, suffers for, for, you know, sort of a suffering figure that uh, ends up usually dying in the end of those those stories but um, I, I was sort of shooting for something a little archetypal and but there, that that said there were there were plenty of guys there who were to my mind you know not necessarily <laughs> all there but but um, but uh, you know that's a it's a dangerous job somebody has to do it you know your question is there your, yes, and then hang on the microphone. There we go. Thank you. First of all, I think your writing is brilliant. I have to say, I think it is just unbelievable. Um, I'm curious, when you talk about your fear of being there and in the moment, did you use that in one scene in particular that I just loved was when Sanborn says to James, why do you do it? Did you use some of your fear in that scene? Because the sequence from that scene to the grocery store, which was beyond brilliant, to the little boy and the jack-in-a-box, and the idea of going from loving so many things to just loving one, and then cutting back to war, I, I just, brilliant. Thank you. Really Thank you. great. Did you did you rewrite like when you were there? Did you use some of what you felt there in some of those scenes, or were those already written? No, th that that I didn't. None of that I was rewritten. I mean, mostly what I did on set like was this the actiony stuff. But um, um, no, I always knew I wanted to send him back, and um, the supermarket. Uh, you know, I I just I don't like supermarkets, <laughs> um, and so when it came time to you know what's a symbol of like uh, sort of the, uh, the emptiness of the consumer society that you know he's purportedly defending among other things, a row of cereal boxes seemed like a good way to do it. But um, uh, yeah, I mean the whole thing really has a lot of me in it, in but in ways that are pretty hard to articulate because it's like I said in the beginning. It's just a big mishmash when I look back on it of of whatever I really feel and whatever these characters told me they felt, you know. Is there a question for the back? Oh, yes, yours, yes. And then yours, sir. I'll get to you next. I uh, echo your comment. The movie is so powerful, so thank you. I have a, a question also about fear. And to go and do that primary research is something that I would love to imagine I would do but would never would be too terrified to even contemplate such a thing. So I'm curious, your relationship to fear, your own path of that when you did that original research for the Playboy piece, and also your relationship, if it was unchanged, to patriotism, and the relationship of seeing our country wreak such havoc on another country, and how, how if and how that affected you, Mark? That's a complicated question. <laughs> um, 
Well, I mean, uh, look, I had no idea what I was getting into, to be honest with you. I, I, I talked to a bunch of reporters before I went over there who had been there, and they gave me specific instructions of what to do and what not to do. And uh, this uh, one lady who had been there for Rolling Stone for quite some time made me promise never to go on Route Irish because that was where it's just they rename all the roads after American roads. They don't want to pronounce whatever the uh, Arabic pronunciation is. So they called this one road that goes from the airport to the green zone, Route Irish. And she said, whatever you do, don't ever go on Route Irish. If they say you have to go, don't go. You know, force them to fly you because that's there are all these machine gun ambushes on Route Irish. So I said, fine, you know, wrote that down. Don't go on Route Irish. And the first night that I was there, you know, they said, we're going out. We're, you know, you want to see an IED? I was like, yeah, you know, that's what I'm here for. And, and, and it's pitch dark, and I get out of this Humvee. I'm, I have no idea where I am. I'm somewhere in Baghdad, and there's gunfire in the distance, and I'm like, okay, with my little pad. By the way, where are we? And the guy goes, oh, we're on Rod Irish. So, I mean, it was like, so I just didn't really know. So it wasn't, I think, the fear was not something I anticipated. I, I was, and I tried to use that in the pl in the, in the film and in the article that did, did this idea of unpredictability, because I think if I had known how um, unpredictable it, it was, I, I, I might not have gone. But anyway, sometimes being ignorant is better. Um, and uh, I don't know if it really changed my feelings of, of patriotism. Um, I, 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 I love this country, and I've, I've always felt very patriotic. It's, um, it really deepened my um, sadness for, for the, the people that have to um, bear the brunt of this war, is, is what it did, more than anything, um, on both sides. You know, it's... Um, it's funny, like you see things on the news, and 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 it's one thing to understand intellectually that that people are getting blown up, and 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 that it's bad. But when you see it firsthand, it it um, it has a, obviously a much a much more profound impact. And um, so, uh, you know, this was partly also my way of hoping that other people could 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 take note of that and and and, and of the damage. There was a. Oh, your question. Actually, th th this gentleman here had a question first, and I'll get to yours next. Yeah. Oh, right. no. I had promised him next. So I'd say. Yeah, at the end of the movie where the protagonist goes back to civilian life and the minutia of it, and then he's back in the war zone, is that a comment that you actually saw? It seemed like he's an adrenaline junkie, and he's like, got to get back. It's that, is that correct? And if so... Was it something you created as a writer, or was it from an observation of these young men and you know at the heart of what you know drives them back because it didn't i I couldn't make out whether he had signed up for a second tour of duty or did he you know volunteer to go like for a second time or what have you yeah i mean I, interestingly i I hung out with some of these guys that i saw in Baghdad when they came back. Uh, and um, it, I was surprised, but they all talked about wanting to go back. Uh, not all of them, not all, some of them. And um, so that's, that's kind of where that came from. And it also felt to me like the rough position of guys, everybody in the military, you know. You kind of have to go back whether you want to or not <laughs> these days. Um, so... Uh, it, it sort of worked on on both levels, and I we just I just felt like mechanically whether he he you know re-upped or w it not that you didn't really need to see that because it would have been a I think I did actually write a scene once where he goes into someone's office and fills out paperwork, but um, I just felt like you could just cut just get him and you'd you know you'd figure it out. Yeah. This gentleman's here had a question. How how would you have predicted? that the military was going to respond to the movie before the movie came out and did your uh did your prediction come true or was it was it wrong or or did you have a sense because of the cooperation maybe you felt you needed to get that they would that they were already in favor of it or what did you have to was there a lot of resistance to what you were doing? How did that all? How did that all work? And talk about that. Uh, okay. There. Um, the response from the military. 
Look, the military is a is when we say military, you're, I mean you're talking about more than a million people. So, uh, but uh, so uh, it's hard to generalize. But we've done a number of screenings um, for EOD guys specifically, and um, the response from from that's the bomb squad from those guys has been. Uh, very, very positive. Uh, um, I think because, you know, they fit, like, again, at the risk of generalizing, like, their world had been, in some sense, acknowledged, and there's there's a lot um, that carries a lot of value for somebody that, that feels like they may be toiling in, in, in obscurity otherwise. Um, and, uh, you know, I've done a lot of promotional screenings and stuff, and, and usually there's one or two people that come up at the end of the screening that say, hey, I was in... Iraq in 04 or 07 or whatever. And those are always, to me, great conversations to have because um, uh, they, you know, that's your toughest audience, really. And um, and I think, um, uh, I, I, I don't know that I thought about how, how it would play to a military audience particularly. I just wanted it to come out in theaters. But but when it did, um, it, that those have been really gratifying moments. Uh, among the most gratifying, and as well as moments when somebody comes up and says, like, you know, my son is an EOD, and you've, and I didn't really fully understand what he did, or a, a wife, or a, you know, s or a, a guy that's an EOD says, look, I'm going to show this to my kid in 20 years. Um, so stuff like that's been really mm. nice. Officially, with the military, we didn't have any um, interaction one way or another. Um, st you know, during the making of the film, we we. Explored uh, some kind of support agreement with them early on, and it didn't. It just didn't work out. Um, but um, it wasn't the right film for them to support. They were supporting Transformers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> seriously, and uh, <laughs> that's another conversation. But um, uh, 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 you know, I think they they're they're. Um, um, the, the reaction's been positive, and that's uh, it, it's it's nice because uh, while I didn't make it for the military per se, you, you, it's it would be it would be um, disappointing if the people that 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 had lived it, you know, hated it. <laughs> I had a it's an interesting question with respect to military psychology that that unfolds in the movie, and it it it, it touches upon something you'd said earlier, where the, you know there's that moment when we see. James, William James's more nurturing side when they're you know caught in that that the, they're being sniped upon out there in the desert in that ambush, and it, it struck me it's very systematic. This was unfolding for me as I was watching the film because when we first meet William James, you know the the sympathetic previous boss of the of the team has just died, and so William James steps in and says, "I won't try to fill his shoes. I'll just try to do the best I can." Very mild, you know. And you think, okay, good, mild, make work kind of guy. But then he does that crazy thing the next day, just pushes the envelope so far, and comes back very relaxed while the other guys are all freaking out. And I thought, this is like a real leader because he doesn't care if they like him or not. He's like he's deliberately doing. He, he was deliberately screwing with these guys. And then later, the, even his being nurturing toward Eldridge is. I don't know, it, it just struck me as a strategy. It's like like you see football coaches, you even see tough English teachers will do this where they'll, they'll rough you up and then suddenly say, no, you can do it. This is, you, just, uh, is it, you can do it. That little bit of nurturing is, on the one hand, nurturing. On the other hand, it's very calculated. And it's very much a part of what the mystery is of leadership. It struck me. And I'm just wondering if you could talk about the development of that character, what you'd observed of military men dealing with one another that way. Um, yeah, I mean, it is about leadership in some senses. And... Um, that one of the nicest compliments I got, actually, uh, to your question, Alan, is is from was from a guy who was a command sergeant major in charge, you know, the, for a whole battalion and whatever it was, three thousand people, blah blah blah. He said, "Hey, that was a real, uh, to me, a real demonstration of not cookie cutter like cartoon leadership, but how it actually can play out in in the world." And um, and so uh, leadership, masculinity. You know, courage, fear, all those things were kind of themes um, that I wanted to uh, tack on to, to this poor character. And, um, and and also just have a little fun with him. I mean, I think in, in, in real life, he, you know, he's, he's much, I think good leaders are probably much more attuned to the to the needs of the people they're leading than James is. I mean, he's unnecessarily... Um, 
uh, removed and remote because that's who he is and that's a, a more interesting character to watch. Mm. But, um, uh, you know, the the whole notion of, of courage under fire, you know, mm. that was something else I was thinking about. Somebody told me that, uh, you know, you never can tell. It doesn't matter how brave you are or how what it, how tough you are it's a, it's a physiological thing and that you can't predict how you're going to react when like you think you might get shot and there are bullets pinging around you and you could be the toughest guy you could have knocked 20 people out and he's seen and he was telling me he'd seen this and yet at that moment you're crying like a baby and somebody else who might just be more normal you know is at that moment fine tough to predict because you, you're never going to be able to simulate those kind of circumstances so that was another thing with the Eldridge character and James and Eldridge is kind of ticking along and then he just loses it but James it turns out is is, is able to handle those situations and I think p some people are just wired that way yeah I wanted to circle back a little further in your career just a, a moment because talking about you know the element of being surprised in your own craft or surprised by what you're learning you know you collaborated I believe you not only sold the article to Paul Haggis but actually worked with him on the development of the script and I was wondering if you could talk about what was the most surprising thing to you as a craftsperson you learning the craft of screenwriting what what was the thing the, the real takeaway for you when you were working with Paul well, it's hard, man. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really hard. Um, I, I, not that I ever thought it was easy, but it's staggeringly complicated. And um, you know, Paul and I would do these outlines and uh, the structure um, of a, of a, you know, that's a mystery, uh, thriller, murder mystery, what have you. Um, you know, all the different, how the kind of math of it really was mm. was uh, it. It reminded me of you know, calculus or something. It was, uh, um, it's, uh, it's, re it's really hard. It's really an art form. And, and I, um, I, uh, you know, I, I uh, approach it with a lot of humility because um, it'll kick your ass if you think, you know, if you think it's easy. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, I, I think I learned a lot, by the way, from working with Paul and I was shocked to find out when I sat down to really work on Hurt Locker how little of it was applicable to the next movie, you yeah. know, because yeah. I thought he was telling me the general rules to write a screenplay, and I was like, okay, I'm good to go. He was just telling me the rules to write that screenplay, you know, yeah. and so um, that was kind of a horrifying thing to realize. <laughs> 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 but uh, but um, uh, it's it's been a great uh, a great learning experience and there's you know I, I obviously you know if I can I think I will keep doing it and and the, it's it's a it's one of the great art forms so so to the extent that you can uh, you know keep learning I think that's good. You've had excellent collaborators to go with the ma the uh, terrific material you're providing and I was wondering if we could talk just a little about that because um, you know one of the ways to protect a script, I mean, is to, is to find a director who you can bond with and who you can trust. Someone who is actually getting it, at, you know, is like a complete peer shoulder to shoulder with you and is seeing, has the same movie in mind that you do. And I'm wondering if you could talk just a little about the work with Catherine Bigelow that was on a creative side, you know, like what was, how did she help you find the movie in an even better way? You know, f given what you'd turned in, what w what were some of her directions to you in the in the in the rewrite before you stepped in producing? Um, well, we really, <coughs> you know, this was only my second film, so I don't know how how the others work, and uh, I I understand that sometimes people write something, or most of the time, and then it just gets shipped off. And I was actually talking to. Uh, Anthony Peckham the other day at a round table who wrote uh, Invictus and he told me that he wrote that and sent it off and that was that and Clinton didn't change it and shot it and I was like you never had a conversation you know <laughs> we said no why would it you know so but we had you know quite a few conversations and um, you know we I, I don't know we talked a lot about um, how to uh, you know, in any given scene, most effectively accomplish whatever it was we were trying to accomplish. And, um, you know, she had the virtue of obviously uh, more than 20 years of experience uh, in the uh, in the industry.
industry, and she had written a couple of her own movies as well. And and I had the uh, virtue of having actually seen the stuff we were talking about firsthand. So um, that was, I think, a really um, you know fortuitous combination. Yeah. And um, uh, I, I think it's great, by the way, when when writers and directors collaborate, and also when writers and actors can collaborate. And you know, being on set and not just rewriting the action sequences, but you know, they're some of the funniest lines in the movie. I hate to say it, you know. It were you know like Brian Garrity's idea or Jeremy Renner's idea or um, Anthony Mackie's idea and um, you know if they said something at lunch and I was like you know and to put that in and um, there's uh, there's that's the magic to me of this medium is that it's it's such a collaboration between so many different people mm. um, that uh, you know to me if you took any one of the people involved in the film out uh, of the major players it would have been a different movie I mean not just saying that in a trivial sense but a profoundly different film yeah and uh, you know I it, it's 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 very difficult to go back and unravel and say what influence where led to what because it's uh, it is just such a sort of democratic kind of like melange of things um, uh, but that said the main virtue was that we both agreed Catherine and I on a shared vision for th for the movie as like really intense character driven super realistic super naturalistic and once you have those as your kind of like and put the audience in the soldier's shoes and and make them feel like they're the journalist on the ground and once you have that as marching orders if you get a little lost you can always kind of refer back to those first principles and they'll ho hopefully sort you out yeah how about just in the basics of uh, your day-to-day -day craft i mean how do you uh, how do you Govern your day. Do you, do you do you write every day, or do you let things gestate? And I and don't govern my day. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I governed my day. Um, <laughs> I had to sign his letters. Govern yourself accordingly. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I uh, when I'm I, I tend to be kind of bingy. When I'm writing, I'm writing, and that's pretty much all I'll do. And. Uh, I, try to you know really simplify my life and not think about anything else and uh, um, uh, but no rules really some sometimes I end up writing in the morning sometimes at night uh, it's 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 proven very difficult for me to write and juggle the business side of Hollywood at, at the same time I mean journalism I worked it, it's, it has its own kind of rhythms and its own kind of deadlines but basically you go out and report and you're out there talking to people and you're collecting information and that can be anywhere from a week to six months and then at the end of that you stop reporting basically and you lock yourself in your room and you've got all these notes and you sit down and you write it up then after that you may go out and re-report and I guess actually that's kind of what I did here I would do a draft and then you know show it to Catherine um, and uh, think about it myself and if there seemed to be something else to do or, or whatever I would either go back and if I had the idea write it or go you know look at notes or call somebody up and say you know what I've got a scene with some snipers and blah 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 and you know what do you think and somebody might you know some guy might say well you know truthfully Mark if you shot somebody with a 50 caliber Barrett their head would blow off so I think your scenes idiotic and you go, okay thank <laughs> you hang up the phone that guy is not gonna help me but you know you try to find you try to find um, a way in however you can right more questions. Ah, oh, great. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll later. So, uh, one more from you, and, and then we'll, yeah. uh, question uh, Here's the mic front, yeah. Um, did you actually, uh, the uh, the machine that goes to the bomb was sort of a big part of the story in a sense, you know, use it or not use it. Did you actually see any bombs go off, or how did that, how did that affect you? Well, that actually, um, that, that little robot which is in the movie, the Talon, is a real robot that we got from uh, north of Bremen on loan. Speak of uh, military cooperation, and um, uh, that was actually you know one of the few sort of character revealing points to what these EOD guys would do. And there was actually a stylistic difference between some of the texts that I observed, and some of them were more likely to use the robot, and some of them thought the robot was like a why use a robot when you can send a man down, you know? So um, there was that difference, and uh, that became kind of the character the point of character difference between the opening guy who uh, you know is very reluctant to go down on the bomb for good reason and and the James character who's you know thinks like 
I'll just go handle it. But it's not quite as 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 cowboyish as that. There are r actually pretty good tactical reasons for not using the robot, mostly because the robot takes longer. And what you can do with the robot in an hour, you can do with your hands in in a minute. You know, if it, if it's complicated, depending you know on how it is. So, um, and the longer you sit in any one place, the in, the greater your likelihood is that someone's going to attack you, uh, because word gets around the neighborhood. Hey, there's five Americans, you know, on the corner of Fairfax and Third. Let's Oof. let's go down there and you know beat them up. So there there were plenty of guys who preferred to just deal with the bomb and not sit around in the neighborhood, and some guys who were more afraid of the bomb. Um, and yeah, I saw stuff blow up all the time. I mean, I, I fortunately never nobody uh, died on my watch, although um, EOD at that time was the most dangerous job in the military, statistically speaking, with a you know mortality rate five times higher than any other. But uh, I was very lucky, and my guys were very lucky. But that said, they blew up stuff probably ten times a day. Oh, I saw I saw I saw a lot of explosions. You actually see explosions that you didn't know was gonna go off, or cause I know they exploded stuff too, right? Yeah, That's yeah. Part of what they did is they yeah. explode stuff. Yeah, sometimes they explode stuff as a way of getting rid of it, which which is which is not a bad technique if you know what you're exploding. A, a very bad idea if you're not quite sure what you're blowing up. You actually see. Oh, a bomb hang on. Uh, 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 sorry. There's another question, but go for it. I just want to say, did you actually see a bomb go off? Yes. Yes. Did you yes. actually see a yes. bomb go off? Yes. Your question. Yes, I um, I read that your next project is going to be developed in South America, in an area that is supposed to be sort of dangerous. So I was wondering if uh, you're going to do some research there. You talk about deep deep contact with the environment. So I was. Yeah, that was for the last one. This one I'm going to send a researcher. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. I'm planning to go down there. Yeah. yeah. And I, I didn't quite catch what the theme is. What, what well, uh, I'm, I'm writing something for Paramount Pictures now, which is called Triple Frontier, which takes place in South America in this border region that they call the Triple Frontier. And uh, it's, it's this uh, area, this drug smuggling hub of South America where Paraguay meets Argentina meets Brazil, uh, kind of a lawless place, uh, which I'll be visiting at some point. Uh, your question there, and then I'll get to you guys over here. Hi, a bit about the collaboration again, in r really technically in regard to, I assume you had a um, consultant on the shoot with you, an explosive um, consultant. You were there in Iraq, and then you spent all that time talking to the techs in Iraq. So what's that combination of collaboration in terms of the design of each device that the person had to deconstruct Jeremy Renner's character, the production designer, the art director, the the tech consultant. Like, how did that? And your own experience. And I assume you didn't stand next to the guy <laughs> defusing the bomb, taking notes. So, mm, not or next to him. I try to be, you know, 100 meters back or so. Um, I took a lot of pictures when I was there. Um, it was it was tricky because most of this stuff is actually. Uh, it's not quite classified, but it's pretty close hold what these things look like. Um, I was able to get, uh, I had a manual of IEDs that the, uh, that the military had that I probably wasn't supposed to have that I gave the production designer. And um, he, <laughs> he was uh, this guy named Kelly Juliuson who did an amazing job. Amman is actually a beautiful city. Um, and he on, on a sh you know, turned it into this, this, this hellhole. Um, with like, I don't know how he did it with masking tape, um, and uh, but he was actually very clever and aggressive. And, and we, we we went down to Kuwait together and on a base, and we did some uh, you know fact finding stuff down there. And he was able to uh, talk to soldiers there who had just come back from uh, from defusing bombs, and they actually had a little museum we stumbled into of, of IEDs uh, in in this uh, EOD headquarters in Kuwait, and. Uh, they said, oh, no, you can't go in there. And I was like, I don't care. I've seen that stuff. I don't need to go in there. And they said to Cal, you can't go in there. And so I said, oh, gee, Cal, I'm really sorry. And he said, don't worry. And about uh, we went off down the hall and talked to these guys for another 20 minutes. And I came back, and Cal was in there with all of them. Mm. <laughs> they were pulling stuff out of drawers, showing him. And, and so he's uh, just an incredible personality, like a six-foot six uh, Norwegian guy with long hair. And... Uh, and so, but um, 
and Jeremy had been had had done some research too, quite a bit of research. Um, so it was kind of there wasn't actually anybody on set that had been in EOD. So it was my recollections and my photographs and Callie's ability to 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 search and destroy and uh, and then uh, you know we made these bombs and sometimes they you know the first time Callie made uh, the IEDs that are in the ground in the um, sort of that first sequence that Jeremy's in where he pulls out the the, the six of them in a circle. He made them out of uh, concrete, and uh, so we go down there, and they were like 90 pounds each, you know. And and <laughs> I said, "Golly, there's no way, you know, anyone's going to be able to pull these out of the ground, you know. That's uh, like 400 pounds. <laughs> He's supposed to lift it up with one hand." So there was some, you know, learning because uh, we couldn't get an actual IED, and we tried because there are so many of them. But Callie uh, certainly tried to get them, and I spent a couple months. I wasted like months trying to get some out of the Jordanian military because they had. I knew they had them. Um, to even spent artillery rounds. People were a little. Like, you know what, you're 20 miles from a war zone, why do you need an artillery round? And you're like, well, I'm making a movie. And they're like, eh, just, no. So we tried to make them out of concrete, and anyway. We, we eventually made them. We've got two questions here side by side, these two gentlemen here, and you can duke it out as to who's first. Hi. Um, going back to your, uh, the creative part when you're uh, in the process of it, um, can you elaborate, like, um, once you did the article for Playboy, and I, I, I'm assuming that you started uh, working on this script primarily after the article, or, or no, actually it? before the article. Before the article, yeah. so, uh, like how long, like around how long do you think it, it took you in, in process, and about how many drafts do you think you went through before you came to the uh, the final script? It was uh, the whole thing was shooting much was probably a little under a year, <laughs> um, eight months, nine months, something like that, and um, it depends how you define draft. I mean, uh, if you define them as a complete rewrite, uh, page one, um, probably, f I don't know, four or five. But if you define it as like a moment where I said, this is never going to happen, and like threw the computer out the window, <laughs> then that's probably happened about f 75 times. <laughs> <laughs> um, the actions of your characters are so profound, and that's because of the extreme conditions they live in. Generally, when you're adapting a character directly from reality, um, it seems almost impossible to empathize with someone who lives in such a potentially potentially horrifying um, horrifying life. How do you how do you create realistic characters without coming off pretentious. And, you know, um, I guess what I'm asking is, how do you pretend to know how someone feels when it's impossible to empathize? Well, I think that's a, that's a good question. It's a provocative question, but um, it, it, yeah, I think you answered it, actually, because it is all about empathy for me. It's about, you know, looking at other people or, or your characters, um, you know, at the same level and not, not being above them. And personally, I would never sign up to defuse bombs. I'm just not going to do it. But um, that, you know, that doesn't give me the right to, or or any any really have a you know point of view, particularly that is superior to a person that does. So um, you know, for me, it's really about having that level gaze as opposed to a god's eye view of what somebody's doing. Another question over here. I just found it really interesting that you're talking about researching about all the journalists that went into screenwriting because I'm also from journalism and, and I really do believe that you earned a spot in that elite group of writers. Thank you. You're welcome. And, and I just had a question about how you developed into the screenwriter that you are now, how you developed your own voice, your style, and if any of the journalistic techniques either hampered you or encouraged you or advantageous in your writing. A little bit of both. I mean, uh, there's certainly parts of journalism that are applicable, um, as like the research for one, um, uh, and um, you know, learning to listen to people and dialogue and so forth. But um, uh, I really did also have to kill a lot of the journalist in me in order to to learn screenwriting, because a lot of the things that come really natural to a, a fictional writer are, and you know, 
an antithetical to, to nonfiction. And um, and it really is a distinct craft and or, or art form or, or both. And um, uh, uh, so you know, in a sense, writing is writing, but in a sense, they're they're apples and oranges. And 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 I really, um, I really tried to approach um, screenwriting with uh, with a very much a beginner's mind, and and like, okay, let me let me just like get the basics down here, and then, you know, but also, I, I mean, I have been paid as a writer since I was 20, so I had some sense of what I wanted to achieve in terms of the effects in the audience and stuff like that, and and and. Um, uh, you know, I, I did a lot of homework mostly by reading scripts that I liked, and 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 or you know, and and if there was a movie that I liked, I would go and find the script, and study it, and try to figure out how they achieved those effects that I wanted to achieve. And and some of the best writing I've ever, the advice I've got from other writers is it's all about like, what effects do you want to achieve, and and if if you you know, if you uh, set your set your sights right, you know, then then. Um, hopefully, you can um, you know replicate that kind of sensibility that you like in other in other work, and so that's that's what I sort of did. There is another aspect of journalism that struck me in reading your script, which is the the sort of clean kind of form follows function of the each sentence. You know the way you have to hold people's attention in an article. You just it, it, sentence by sentence, you, you you bore them for one, they, you might lose them, and it seemed that that was an app, uh, applicable discipline from journalism. Does yeah, maybe so. I mean, certainly you get a lot of. Um, you know, I got the shit kicked out of me so many times as a reporter, and I mean, I would go into the Village Voice and hand in these pieces, and the editor would say, like, hey, you think you're Hemingway? You know, get out of here with this shit, you know? And <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, and they would always tell me, people read this on the subway, and so if you can't keep somebody on the subway train as they're jostling back and forth into your piece, then then don't hand it in. So um, it 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 definitely you know it's about telling the story and and getting getting what's most important out there and and really, you know, not being showy until you've earned the right to be showy. That was kind of what, uh, you know, I it was ten years before they let me use the first person. So. <laughs> <laughs> your question over there, yes, sir. A really great job, really moving. I'm wondering, following up on being a reporter and now being a screenwriter, does that affect you when you're in the field, so to speak, about the way you look at an event, the way you look at characters? Has that changed sort of the manner of how you view a situation? In terms of reporting, you mean? In terms of reporting and then thinking about seeing a scene, seeing something that would eventually be in a, in a screenplay. I think it has. I mean, I don't do as much reporting as I used to. Uh, I'm really a full-time screenwriter now, but um, it does it does affect my outlook just in terms of uh, yeah. It, um, that said, I did a piece for Rolling Stone like a, a year or two ago, and it was a great uh, you know great pleasure to go back to just pure journalism. And uh, um, but there was definitely some squeaking of the gears when I handed it in and realized that you know it. It's everything's got to be fact checked, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm sort of my head is is really 99% in screenwriting right now, so uh, that that is how I view the world. But um, uh, I don't know. Hopefully, I can do both, if, as long as magazines. You know, I'm not sure which is going to die first, whether it's magazines or independent cinema. But <laughs> hopefully, they'll both stick around. I want to ask you. You know, you had this wonderful kind of experience as a producer outside of writing. I'm wondering how that's informed your writing. What, what, what was the experience, you know, in other words, like, did it have a positive effect in preparing you for the next script when you were, you know, on the line trying to get helicopters and all that sort of stuff involved? Well, man, I mean, I learned so much about uh, what it takes to produce something, to, to, to make something real. And uh, I think that's useful knowledge, you know. I I, I don't believe I, I I'm sure there's one school of thought that says you should just put all that side all that outside of your head, and just write purely from your imagination. But um, you know, you're writing a movie. I mean, if it's a novel, then then I, I suppose you can do that. But if you're writing a movie you, and the objective is to get it made, I think it's useful to know that kind of stuff. And I was shocked to learn, for example, I remember I had one scene in Hurt Locker that uh, ended up being cut totally, but early on in the line producer said, hey man, it would be really great if you could make this during the day. I was like, why? 
What's wrong with the night? Oh, that'd be a little cheaper if we could do it during the day. And, you know, he was right. And, uh, and the more I thought about it, I realized, you know what, dramatically it doesn't really matter. Mm. And so it does actually focus you. And there are times when you have to say, you know what, I need the helicopter. It's really important. Or I need this or I need that. But I think it's, it's focusing and it's, and it's practical in a good way to, to have that, um, at least it was for me, to have had that experience um, so that next time I write, you know, the guy jumps off a building and parachutes down 50 feet into like a manhole that then turns into like, you know, a submarine. Um, <laughs> I can think like, is that just kind of a fun thing to, to see or is that, or, you know, and, or is it something I really, really need? Right. Do you think you might uh, direct at some point now that you've, you've, you've been sort of in the, in the trenches with just the getting it made? Do you think you might turn to that? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, uh, I think at this point I would like to just keep writing for uh, a, w a while longer and uh, actually remove just from that sense. I'd like to keep writing and, and I think um, if I can make a go of it as a screenwriter, that would be huge. And what your next, your aspirations, I mean, you, it was great that you, to know that you're headed for South America as a topic and I'm just wondering where, what are your other aspirations that you've, you've gotten to the heart of war, it seems to me. Maybe you'll deal with that some more. Do you want to pursue that theme or are there other themes that you're, you're trying to call in now? I'm 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 pretty much open uh, <laughs> to all offers. Uh, <laughs> I uh, I've got another war piece that I want to do. I don't think I want to do. I'm not sure I want to do it next because it's all it's. I'm getting a little burnt out on it. But um, uh, the about Afghanistan um, and uh, you know there's there's actually a lot of ideas that I have and um, so I'd love to just keep. <clears throat> Keep seeing, you know, what sticks against the wall. Throw it out there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for walking us through thank this you. fantastic, um, great answers, and thank you for all your questions. Thank you.